Good evening, welcome. I'm John, I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Lindsay Gardner in support of Why We Cook and in conversation with Abra Behrens this evening. Uh, first, a quick overview of webinars for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed, but you might want to keep that chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Why We Cook from Literati. Uh, we also have signed book plates as a reminder too. So if you want to have a signed book plate included uh, with your book, just let us know in the notes field during checkout. There's also links to purchase books in the description right below me if you're watching us later on YouTube. But if you're watching live, you can submit questions for the Q&A using the Q&A feature available to you at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation this evening. As a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup. If you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that uh, as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for joining us this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending <laughs> on uh, where in the world and when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Lindsay Gardner is an illustrator and mother of two daughters, her favorite sous chefs, her watercolor and gouache illustrations have appeared in cookbooks and editorial projects, advertising campaigns, and stationery and interior design collaborations. This wide ranging artistic sensibility makes her a gentle interrogator of the world around her. Her food art has appeared in Cookie Advent Cookbook, Pies, Fries, and Ice Cream, and The Rituals. You may have also seen her work in Uppercase Magazine, Architectural Digest, Style Carrot, Decorist, and Vogue among others. Originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan, she's now been fortunate to live in the beautiful and vibrant locales of Oakland and San Francisco, California, Chicago, and New York and Middlebury. And Abra Behrens is a chef, former farmer and writer. She started cooking at the storied Zingerman's Deli right down the street in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She then went to train uh, in the Garden Focus Kitchen at Ballymolo Cookery School in Cork, Ireland. In 2009, she co-founded Bare Knuckle Farm in North Point, Northport, Michigan, where she farmed and cooked for eight years. Uh, after years of farming, she returned to the kitchen full-time, opening and helming the cafe at Local Foods in Chicago. In 2017, she left her executive chef position to return to the Mitten State to join the team at Graner Farm in Three Oaks, where she combines her love of farms and restaurants to create one-of-a-kind dinners on the farm, celebrating the best of Southwest Michigan's diverse agriculture. Her first cookbook, Roughage, A Practical Guide to Vegetables, is rooted in her experience as a chef, former farmer, and everyday eater, and aims to help build readers' confidence in preparing vegetables by providing easy-to-follow recipes. And her second book, Grist, A Practical Guide to Grains and Legumes, is due out this fall. Uh, they can't hear you, but they can sense it through the power of the internet. So please join me in a round of raucous applause and welcoming Lindsay Gardner and Abra Behrens into your living rooms. I can feel it. Well, John, thanks so much for inviting us and having us. And Lindsay, thanks for asking me to be a part of this. Um, I have such deep love for Ann Arbor and, and also for Literati as, you know, independent bookstores are shrinking across the country. I think Literati is really, uh, you know, the beacon of how to how to do things well and how to do them right so it's really a treat to be here so thanks for thanks for having me oh thanks for being here this is so fun it's so fun um so we were talking a little bit at kind of the the beginning of this and um just thinking about how there's so many different types of books out there and different cookbooks out there but i was wondering i was hoping you could start the talk tonight by just giving us kind of the origin story of uh why we cook and, and what you were, you know, what your sort of mission for it was. Definitely. Um, let's see, when I think about the origin story about this book, uh, I really immediately go back to my own kitchen in Oakland, California. Um, and I really, it really started with me sort of asking myself a lot of questions and realizing that as a mom, 
I was spending a lot more time in the kitchen and that my relationship to cooking was changing. Um, I'd always loved cooking, but I was, my, my relationship was changing to cooking. And I was just asking all these questions of myself about how cooking fit into the bigger picture of my identity as a woman, as a mom, what I was teaching my daughters, um, why I care so much about it, um, all these things. And then basically I decided to sort of, you know, take those questions into my studio, which is what I often do when I'm asking myself big questions as an artist. Um, and from there, I started simultaneously having conversations with women in my own life and also um, branching those questions out to um, other women in my community. So um, I started kind of thinking, well, if I'm having these questions about like, why, what is the meaning of cooking and what does it all sort of mean in the bigger picture of my identity? Other women are definitely thinking about this and why haven't I read more about that? And why isn't that story something Mm -hmm. that I can easily access and find? Mm -hmm. Um, So that really just sort of naturally led me into these conversations. uh, And it was really an amazing process. It was, uh, the research was a total um, highlight of making this book because it brought me into conversation with incredible women who are doing such fantastic work all over the place and um, in so many different ways. So it was pretty organic the way that that happened. Um, And I guess like, that's the thing I was so struck by with this book is just the sheer volume of of people. It's what 110, 112 women. um, And they're from all different sorts of walks of the food world. Um, What was the like, what was the first interview or like, did you do, cause there's also, this is the thing I love about this book is that it packs such a punch because it's not just recipes, it's interviews. It's, you know, what like meals that were important tips in the kitchen, like all of these different things. So what was the like first conversation that you had? Yeah, you're right. There is a ton of different kind. There are like so many different kinds of content in this book and um, it, it is a cookbook. There are 11 recipes and yours is one of them. Um, mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but uh, there are also essays and um, a series of kitchen portraits and pro- a few profiles that I wrote about um, different people. And then there's also the voices of home cooks that are sort of intertwined throughout the book, which was a really important aspect to me. Um, I, from the start, I just wanted it to be as inclusive a conversation as it could be. So I wanted the, a vast variety of perspectives on this topic, um, in all the different ways. So professionally and home cooks. Um, Mm -hmm. so the first, the first conversation I did was actually with a, um, with a chef who is in the book, her name's Krista Chase. And at the time she was the chef at Tartine Manufactory. Um, and she was generous enough to sit down with me on one of her rare days off and have coffee and just chat about her experience um, coming up through the food industry as a, as a woman chef. And um, you know, one of the really gratifying parts of doing all the research was how welcoming and generous every person that I talked to was. And one, con- one conversation would sort of naturally lead to the next. So Krista, you know, was she at the end of that conversation said, you should talk to this person and this person. And um, it was just that also feels like it's part of this book that just sort of um, community of people that were so engaged in this conversation. Um, And I also at the time had the fortune, good fortune of being able to attend a few events in the Bay Area that introduced me to some incredible writers like Osai Endelin, whose essay is in the book. Um, I saw her speak at an event that was hosted by La Cocina, um, which is an, a wonderful organization in San Francisco. Um, I also met a bunch of people through the CIA in uh, Napa, um, Miriam Ahmed and Stevie Sesiones and Ana Diogo Draper, all these women working in wine. Um, so, you know, being there at that time in 2018, when I was starting to 
conceptualize the book and um, really start to reach out to people was also really a big part of the research. Mm. And so how much of that, you know, I, one of the things I was so amazed by with Ruffage is that um, the book that I had in my mind is in some ways exactly the book that was created, not at all. And so is when you were doing that research and you get, had, had you already put together a proposal for what the book was going to be, or did that come later? And how much does like this, this beautiful book match what you were picturing it to be? Oh, it's such an interesting question. And it's actually kind of hard to go back to that time um, and think about what I thought it would be and what it is now. Um, I think that it's probably like 90% accurate to what I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you know, there's all the sort of visual parts of it that I was working on in my head and I wasn't sure how it would come to be, but really when I think about the best possible scenario that I had hoped for, it really was a lot like this. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, going through doing the early stage research, there were, there was a certain amount of balance that I wanted to achieve in terms of types of content and um, geographic location of people. And I feel like I could have kept tinkering with that forever and ever and ever, because there are just that many talented women to talk about and research and talk with. And so um, that was actually probably the biggest challenge of, mm-hmm. of figuring out how the book would end up was just that I could, I could still be doing that research. There are just so many um, so many women in this field that I could have included here. Right. Hmm. Um, and I guess for me, what strikes me about what you just said is that you already have such a visual sense when you're a visual artist. Um, and for me, not at all, like, you know, bad. I disagree. I disagree. Uh-huh. You just do it in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> but that's usually a perishable way that's best when it's hot. And so that doesn't always. <laughs> but, um, but so, you know, what is the process? Because this book, for those of you who haven't seen it, is is fully illustrated and with these beautiful sort of I, what I would call watercolors. I don't know if that's I don't have all of the, the lingo, but that's what they look like to me. And Um, and so what was the process for going from like, or I guess, is there a process for how those illustrations come to be? And and part of why I asked as a little caveat is I remember being as someone without an artistic bent, I remember being so struck when I saw Guernica, um, at the La Reina Sofia in, in, uh, Madrid about how the entire room that leads up to that, you know, giant painting are all of Picasso's sketches and all of the like little, they almost look like doodles, but they're just, it's the pre-work for it. And it had never, I think I just thought people like, oh, there's a blank wall. I'll just paint Guernica. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's really not how it works. So how does that work for you as a visual artist? Uh, well, I think it's pretty incredible that you're putting me in the same sentence as Picasso mm-hmm. there, but I'm just going to go with it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm glad you asked that because as a first time author going through this process was totally new to me. It was all learning. I've illustrated books, but I haven't illustrated and written books before. And so um, this was, it was a really exciting and interesting part of making this book was because I was so involved in writing it and compiling the different um, parts of the text and also illustrating the whole thing. Uh, It was a very, it felt like a very cohesive and collaborative situation and working with the designer at my publisher, Workman, her name is Sarah Smith. Um, we, we basically approached the whole book as a, a very complicated puzzle. Um, <laughs> and she's like a saint for going through this with me. But um, so I sketched every piece of uh, every illustration from small spot illustration to, you know, a stripe that you see on the side of the page that was all sketched first. And she laid out all of the manuscript um, with all of the fonts and everything first with the sketches so that by the time it came, uh, it, it was, re- I, it was all done. Then I knew exactly where I wanted to, um, put 
that illustration and I knew if it would span from one edge to the other, the full spread or off the left corner of the page. Um, so it, it was really a map for how the, how the book would come together visually. And what I love about that is that um, it just felt from the beginning that the illustration and the text were uh, holding equal weight through the book. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that felt like a reflection of the collaborative process that I had been through in making it, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. It does, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it just seems like it's, um, it's another way to reach people, right? That like some people are, are visual learners. I mean, and I guess reading is a type of visual learning, but if we just, I think those are actually separate parts of our brain. I mean, I'm not a, a scientist, but um, you know, they feel different to me. And I think that's the part where it feels like this book has so much for everybody to come into and that you can just drop into it. And that's how I've been enjoying it is just like, you know, I'm going to go to bed. I've got, you know, 20 minutes before I want to turn off the light. I'll just pick it up and like flip to a new page and then read something and learn something new. And I just love it in that way. Um, and I would imagine that for people who, if reading is a challenge, then all of the, that, that art just really can bring them in, which is great. Yeah, that was a big, that was a big goal from the beginning too. I wanted to have it be um, accessible at any point so that you could open it up in the middle and read a two page essay and flip to a different page the next day. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing that, I mean, cause I think that speaks to my next question, which is that, uh, I don't wanna say this. There's a lot of sameness in cookbooks and, and how like, one of my friends once said like, oh, that's a cookbook that people put together thinking, I know what a cookbook looks like. And then there's like following that model. And I feel like one of the things I was just struck by with this book is that it's really sort of a like genre bending book. Like it's, it has recipes in it. So in that sense, it's a cookbook, but it has storytelling and it has all of these other things. And was that something, I mean, A, how do people, how have you found people are relating to it? But then also, was that a challenge to sell to your publisher? <laughs> like, I feel like there's so much like, oh, it's the joy of cooking plus uh, salt, fat, acid, heat. And I, I don't have any models for that for your book. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think, yes, when I think back to the process of writing the, uh, the proposal, which I was doing in 2018, um, it was a challenge from the beginning, to be honest. And it's also, I think, like secretly, not so secretly, one of the things I'm the most, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I'm the most proud of about the book is that it is kind of, um, it does kind of defy an easy category, uh, which may not be easy for a bookseller necessarily, but um, I think that when I think about my relationship to cooking, it is all of these things. And so it makes a lot of sense to me, but yes, you're right. It was difficult to explain that. And um, as you know, from writing books and creating proposals, you have, to, you have to explain a lot of that from the beginning and show your map of how you're going to achieve it and then show a publisher why they should buy it. Right, so, and how to sell it, you know. And I how mean, to sell it. I think that, it sounds like both you and I came into the book world um, to add to the conversation, but the truth of the matter is this is a capitalist system and we have to sell these books, you know, and right. it's hard. To, I'll actually be interested to hear what John thinks about this um, as someone who works on the front lines of selling books, you know, is that something that is, is there a movement towards that in the industry and all those things, but we'll wait till he gets back. Um, well, I mean, I think it's something bit. like you, um, you could also probably relate to this from writing roughage that, and I think that is happening across the publishing industry more and more is that, um, there is this recognition and, uh, ongoing goal, I would say to recognize and publish more about people's stories. Mm. And I think that that is definitely, it's definitely happening in the, the food media, 
that we're seeing more and more, which is great. Um, but I think that, you know, even like when I go browse a cookbook section of a bookstore, or when I did that in person a year ago, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, you, you can see that starting to happen more and more. And I think your book is a, is a great example of that actually. Well, thanks for saying that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Cause I think for me, um, you know, like people always ask like, you know, well, yeah, why do you cook? What's, what's the point of it? And for me, it's like, I love eating and I love like serving people. And that's probably the ins and outs of the actual day to day of my work, but it's really about the people and, um, you know, either the people who are coming to eat at your table or the people who put that food on your table. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that you really hit on something because one of the things that feels so sinister about the sort of rise of celebrity chef culture is that it kind of seeded that authority from where the majority of food is cooked in this world, um, which is in domestic kitchens and often by women to another, uh, which is usually sort of hyper, um, I don't know, hyper masculine is the right thing, but like this like competitive edge. And I feel like it's had this sort of detrimental, um, like, I think we've talked about this before, how like somebody will say, oh, like, I don't know, is this good? And I'm always so struck by that sense because it's like, we, everybody, you know, God willing gets to eat every day. And so like, if it tastes good to you, then it's good. Right. And, and when you were, you know, if I was so poignant that you included so many voices of home cooks, did you feel that tension between a home cook or a professional cook or was that broken down by everyone being women? Like, how did that sort of come up for you? I think I did. I think I did. I think I wanted to, there was a real sense of sort of, I know that I'm part of this, um, bigger picture, but I don't know how, and, and why aren't there more stories that are looking into that? Like, why isn't there more of a resource into sort of like how we relate to this bigger sense of why cooking matters to people. And, um, yes. And then as soon as I started digging into the research, I realized that there was so much there and that, I mean, I'm not part of the culinary industry and, and even from that outsider's perspective, it was so obvious um, mm. that all of that was there to explore. And I think that, that it was, you know, sort of a reflection of the conversations I was having in my personal life with my close friends and other women who were balancing all of these things in their lives, their, you know, domestic responsibilities, their professional goals and ambitions, raising kids, you know, all, all of it and sort of wondering, mm -hmm. well, you know, these voices are not the voices that are reflected in cookbook culture or in food media. And we are a big part of what's happening here. So um, definitely that was a big, a big goal from the beginning. And so you said that part of what was the impetus for this book was um, how you were talking to your daughters about food and how your relationship to food changed for them. I'm interested in now how the book maybe has changed that conversation with your daughters if you're comfortable some people don't want to talk about their home life and that is totally reasonable um so that's like part a and then part b is sort of now we've all gone through this or we're i mean we're still in it this global pandemic where everyone's cooking from home and so do you feel like how do you feel like that has affected your internal conversations and also sort of the larger conversation around food in this way um well Okay. First part of that question, you, I will try probably not to cry while I'm answering it, but, mm -hmm. um, my daughters have been such a huge part of this since the beginning and have been like just the best fan club and the best, uh, mm -hmm. supporters and, um, sidekicks at all times. And have, we've also had some really interesting conversations as a family about, you know, what it means for me to be publishing a book and they both identify as <laughs> writers and artists mm -hmm. and cooks. So I feel like I've achieved <laughs> a lot just yeah, there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is really cool for me to see them ha have seen me go through the whole process of making it from the start because mm -hmm. they got to see a lot of the hard work that was involved in it and go from start to finish. So um, like Last night, my younger daughter, who's five and a half, 
was literally in bed curled up with the book and asked me to read part of it to her. So there's like all those magical moments that have happened. And that's very special for a number of reasons, not only because of what it means to me, but also because of the stories that are in the book and the women that they get to learn about. So that's been really, really cool. Um, The second question in terms of sort of the pandemic and my relationship to cooking, I think, um, you know, three years ago when I started this, I, who would have ever predicted that this is where we would be now? And I think if I knew then what we would be going through now, I actually don't think I would have changed much about the book, which is a really great feeling. I think that, um, I think that many of the messages that were part of this project from the beginning have been strengthened by the challenges that we've gone through in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, and if anything, it speaks to the tremendous resilience of women in so many different situations, professionally and domestically. Um, and I think that all of that has just sort of coalesced that message has come together because of what we've gone through. And, you know, when I think back to the process of making it, like I was painting all of these illustrations through lockdown in California. So like I was working on all the final illustrations basically from February of 2020 to, uh, the fall of 2020. Um, so even just that part of it, you know, that's something that I think of when I think about the book as a whole and my experience making it like I relate to the book and the content through that lens of sort of focusing on each person and and their contribute contribution to the culinary landscape um, through illustrating some por- some portion of their story at a time that was tremendously tense and right. you know wrought with all of these really difficult issues. So I will always relate it to that. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I think that that's so fascinating on, on both a personal level and on sort of a larger role that, um, you know, in some ways, a lot of women's work is hidden work or it, I mean, it's certainly not paid uh, in the same way and that, that emotional labor as well as the physical labor of it. Um, and so to have those stories still feel true, even when everything around it has shifted, I think really speaks to um, the universality of of you know food and 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 women's roles in it um is there something i guess we're getting close to the question and answer time so i want to be respectful of that but um is there something that you took away from this book that i guess maybe what did you think you would take away from it and then what have you taken away from it and what do you hope others will take away from it Ooh. Three part question. Um, You're just going to keep getting longer and longer. (laughs) uh, Okay. I think that when I started this um, and one of the like biggest joys of making it was that I didn't even know how much there was to know. Um, And I actually feel that way still after doing this much research and spending this much time with this topic that I still have so many questions. And I think that that is, um, I think that actually answers all all three of your questions in a little, in a, in a small way that like, I didn't know I had an inkling. I had all these questions that were at the basis of my inspiration. And then I started getting into it and I was like, yeah, there's a lot here. And I think that over time, my appreciation for all of those things has deepened and And also led to more questions. And so I guess that uh, that is what I've taken away from it. Like I feel that when I am cooking and when I'm thinking about my own relationship to food and cooking, which is every single day, multiple times a day, that these stories, that these women's stories are with me, their voices are with me. And that feels um, like a real... uh, relationship. It feels like, um, it feels like solidarity and it feels like connection. And that I think is, um, that is, I mean, 
God, what I'm so grad, so grateful for that. If I can walk away with an, from this experience with that feeling. And I, I hope that that's what people take away from reading the book too, is that, that they feel that connection and that they're inspired to ask more questions about what it is in their life and how they can connect to food and cooking in a different way or deepen their relationship to a family recipe or a person through food. I mean, there's so much to explore. And I think that our relationships with food and cooking are at the basis of so much connection, whether it's personal or community-based or global, you know, it's all possible. So I hope that's what people take away from it. That reminds me so much of um, uh, Tehal Rowe, I read to the New York Times was, and, uh, was talking about how um, when she, she's at sort of like a, I don't remember the word she, it wasn't necessarily tense, but like, you know, when she needs that, uh, she'll say out loud her grandmother's names and her mother's name and, and that sort of like incantation of, of these names and how, um, you know, I think it's really remarkable to be born into a family that has strong connections and, and to have that within your own family, but also recognizing that I feel like you sort of gave everyone a new set of names to be able to call on, to feel like someone's like at the wheel with you, you know, and, and pushing forward. Um, and, and that feels really that I hadn't really thought about the book in that way. Um, but that does feel really true. And it, it, I think speaks to, um, well, I mean, just the inclusivity across the board about what it means to, to see yourself or to see a shared experience with someone who, you know, you might never cross paths with is sort of the beauty of food in that way. You know, in a lot of ways, it's a great equalizer um, even though it's still one of the most stratified ways that we live our lives. Um, I don't really have a question. I just <laughs> I'm just um, like, yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, bing, bang, yep. we're done. <laughs> um, no, I, yeah, that's, that's just so interesting. And, and I mean, man, good on you for, to, that story about your daughter wanting to like using your book as a, as an, as a bedtime story to read through, like, I mean, God bless women who are raising girls, you know? Um, but also still no question, yeah. <laughs> um, which is maybe a good sign. Uh, maybe we should call John back. And like, <laughs> like, like, all, uh, all the time. But yeah. so, uh, John, maybe you can help us out and switch us to the, the Q and A. And also remember we had some questions for you, which is about um, just sort of the nature of um, basically, is it a pain to have a book that doesn't fit tidily into a specific genre? I, I think it's a pain for my <laughs> colleagues um, who have to reorganize sections. Um, and we, you know, I wish my colleague Jean was here. She's sort of every time we've, we've reorganized sections for flow and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, all taxonomies are bullshit, which is, I, I don't know. Don't, I don't want to get. I should off just on... put that on the back of my book. <laughs> Taxonomies are bullshit. I don't want to get off on on uh, some sort of philosophical tangent, but I think Sorry. they we think a lot about it in terms of how we're marketing books as well. But as I was uh, saying to both of you before we went live, I think our customers are really eager for these kinds of books that are bending you know, the received form of what a, a cookbook or like a, a large coffee si table size book about food, which is sort of normally going to be seen as a cookbook can be. Um, and I think for us, for me, that's exciting. I mean, Literati is very committed to the idea of the book as an object more so than the book as like a instruction manual or, or whatever. And so I think what I was saying was that people will buy Mark Bittman, salt, fat, acid, heat, which itself is sort of like not hybrid, but it's mm. it's a conceptual book. Uh, yeah. Or some other things that are just sort of like, or the Odalangi books are sort of like the popular, like chef focused ones or whatever. Mm. Um, but they are gravitating towards these books that are, that, that include these stories that, that, um, 
are maybe not like recipe forward or focused so much as they are something to experience. So the fact that that you can take this book into bed with you was, I think, so uh, exciting. Um, and I think that I think for us as a bookstore, yeah, I mean. <laughs> we have to code things for inventory purposes <laughs> and everything else and merchandising and marketing is a part of the business. And uh, I'm not in charge of it for a reason, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, I think, um, what, what leads me to a question I have, there's some questions for Lindsay about whether you are a cook yourself. And we've, we've sort of talked about this about it's, you kind of mentioned it about home cook, right. And professional chef, um, which are these, for as an outsider, are these distinctions that I've started to hear being around books in the book industry um, and also living uh, with a chef. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I'm just sort of curious for you, Lindsay, I mean, it's, it's one thing to compile a book where you're talking about these things through the, um, the lens of, of, of gender and, and, and women's experiences being across these divides, right? But for you, putting out a book that's about food as a not a quote unquote professional chef, what I wonder how the book reflects your own experiences moving through uh, that industry. Um, and and um, I don't know, like, I don't know if that makes sense, but navigating totally this as, sense, as, yeah. as someone is like, you're putting out a food book, but you are you're an illustrator. Mm. Um, and, and so the book seems to speak to some of the experiences that, or s could reflect upon some of the experiences you've had yourself just in the process of putting the book out in this weird sort of recursive way. So I don't, that's also not a question, but I'm wondering if you could speak on it, that. It is a question. It's a great question. I think that, um, okay. So when I think about that and how I relate to that, it again, goes back to some of the driving questions for the book, which were really sort of the cross for me, the crossovers between my art practice and uh, cooking, and why though why there felt like there was a connection there for me, which uh, when I think about like Abra, you said earlier, I'm not like visual, whatever, but like you know, you are very much that, and you're doing that in your own practice creatively, and I see so many connections between what chefs do when they put. Uh, to when they when they are actually in the process of making something and then when they put that thing that they've made onto a plate and give it to someone else um, there's so much crossover there between an art my visual art practice and the culinary art practice and so that was at the like at the root of a lot of the questions that I was asking um, and I still think about that every day when I'm cooking I mean I may not like I mean we don't need to interview my family about what it looks like at lunchtime, but you know, I, it's just, that is a big part of what is inspiring to me about cooking is not only the visual way that it looks, but the process of being in it and the, um, the, the actual, all of the, like what you're doing with your hands and your senses and then putting it together in a visually appealing way. And then actually being able to share that with someone else that's where all the crossover and the magic is for me personally. Um, and I, I think that gave me sort of going at a lot of the questions that drove the book from that angle was, in was interesting to people that I interviewed. I think that, that that was something that I don't think people in the culinary industry, like maybe they don't get to talk about that a lot, but that is a, such a huge part of what they do. Related to, to the question you asked me and to this question for both of you, and maybe especially for Ebra, um, since you are a, a, a professional, professional chef or came from, come from the industry itself and have a cookbook out and have another cookbook coming out. Um, but you, your career also is rooted in cooking happening beyond the confines of you know like the michelin restaurant say or something like that and and into our everyday experiences and accessible to everybody so i, I i'm wondering what what for you the experience is like to see this move this this change not just in how uh people are experiencing food um especially as as uh, uh 
uh, restaurants focusing on local provisions and stuff like that, or re returning to stuff that's more traditionally had and say like the family meal at a restaurant instead of the sort of plated experience, what it's like to witness books that come out that are speaking to this, like Lindsay's, and to also still be a part of uh, this industry um, that, you know, is still seeking to put out cookbooks by professional chefs. It's, but it seems like the lines are being blurred. So I'm wondering, in the same way that we're talking about Lindsay's book operating in this very cool, but liminal space, what's, what it's like from your perspective. I mean, that's an interesting question because I think it speaks to what people's motivations are for books. And we've talked a little bit about sort of the nature of celebrity chefdom kind of seeding or like taking ownership or authority away from women who are cooking in their own kitchens. And I think that we're starting to see some of that play out in books that like, um, I think that cookbooks for quite a while were really aspirational, um, you know, in this way that was unachievable. And it was meant to, to be almost like a time capsule of, you know, a Michael Mina restaurant or, you know, sh whatever sort of Chez Panisse at that particular moment in time. And I think that's interesting in terms of culture, um, but it's not that relevant to most people. <laughs> Chez Panisse may be an exception to that. Um, you know, and so I think it depends on why people are buying books. And so if it's just to be dazzled or like, you know, Charlie Trotter is a great book. Like those books are beautiful. And he was such an important voice, especially in the Midwest, um, you know, cause it was, it was coastal food that was happening in Chicago. Um, but those restaurants are nothing impossible to follow. They're like eight pages <laughs> long and it's like, it's like never going to happen. Um, and so I think that what we're seeing is sort of like a middle ground between that of, of things that maybe try to, and what I wanted to do with Ruffage was to try to create something that would instruct and, and share some of the perspective that I think you gain by cooking, you know, more than eight hours a day, five, maybe seven days a week. Um, and, and what that can mean and how people can bring that into their own homes, but without all of the stuff that inherently comes with that. And I think one of the things that we don't talk that much about and that I really felt for the first time writing Grist is the desire for it to not be boring. Um, like, so Grist is about grains and legumes. A lot of those ingredients are interchangeable. So like, if you're gonna cook black beans, you can probably cook pinto beans, which probably means you can cook black eyed peas. And there's just not so many different ways to do it. And for the first time, I found myself being like, this is too boring. And my <laughs> inclination was to like, oh, well, you know, these white beans are so good with saffron and like, you know, sa you can get saffron, like, but do people get saffron? <laughs> like, I don't think that people actually do. And so it was this interesting thing and, and Ruffin was so much about like, you should be able to, um, I was living between Northport, Michigan and uh, Pilsen on the South side of Chicago and was like these, my grocery stores are polar opposites. Like one's a corner store and one is like a rural Michigan grocery store. And I don't want people to feel like they don't, they can't get what they need to make these. But I think that there's, so my answer is long winded in that I think why people are writing books is changing. I think what they're for is changing. And I think we're returning to actual practical home cooking. Um, and I think that professional voices can write books that are good for home cooking, but it's, an, it's a very deliberate choice because if you just write what you know and you cook in professional kitchens all day long, you're gonna give something different. But then also I think to your point and what we were talking about earlier is that Food is really about the people. And so what does it mean if you don't know who, uh, I was just listening to a podcast with the um, founder of uh, um, A Growing Culture. And he was just talking about like, if you don't know the people who are raising the chocolate, how are you supposed to identify with their struggle? And how are you supposed to care? And I think that is true across all parts parts of the industry and probably true across other industries as well in terms of fast fashion and um, you know different things like that but I hope that that's where it goes next which is starting to turn some of the shine that has been given to chefs onto the people who are pulling that food from the soil through their very yes kitchen. and also from the stories that and the um, the origins of those food traditions I think also is 
equally as important. I think that people are really starting to, well, I hope that people are starting to pay more attention to that. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's where I think, Lindsay, you just did such a nice job of including so many voices that touch on so many different parts of that experience. And also, you know, there's a, a really important conversation that's happening right now about decolonializing our plates and, you know, paying homage to comes from and the like racist and colonialist history that you know really affected it and there's a really beautiful piece um i forget where it was published but it's um if you google rice and cornrows um it'll come up and that sounds like a terrible thing to google but it's really it's what i googled when i needed to find this piece and it's about how when slaves were when people were enslaved uh through the the slave trade um, before leaving their homeland, were braiding uh, seeds for rice yeah. and peas and beans into their hair. And it was a form of sustenance and survival. And, and now to have, I was just reading something and it was talking about how the phrase Southern is a code word for unhealthy. And I was just so furious at my own home kitchen. And I'm not sure I would have occurred to me to be that way even a year ago. Um, and so I think you do a really wonderful job of including those stories. Um, there's a chef, uh, Ashley Shanti, who is from North Carolina, who is, who's very explicitly working on exactly those uh, scenarios in food. She's very uh, consciously bringing to the forefront the food ways of West Africa and Appalachia and um, she was the chef at a restaurant called Bene on Eagle in Asheville. And Bene is a seed that was carried from West Africa, just like you were saying. So all, yeah, yes. There's a question. So if anybody was like, okay, I got this book and now I need to dive into something else. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's fine. Um, there's, there's, someone's asking if, if Lindsay can highlight or show a picture uh, from some some of the most moving stories in the book, or maybe just, I think, if, if we want to try to hold up the book and give a little preview of something. Like a little slideshow? Sure, um. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. We want, to, want to, we want people to buy the book to truly experience <laughs> it, but we can maybe show them a sneak peek of what, I what will they say, will find. I will say, this is probably very biased, but hold it, like seeing the book in real life is a very different experience than seeing the illustrations on, on screen. But um, this is one of my, this is one of my um, go-to answers to that question, which is um, the illustration that I made for um, Yuande Komalafe's essay. And uh, she wrote about, I don't know if you guys can see that that well, but um, she wrote a short essay about a memorable meal. And there are several of them in the book. And hers is about the first time that she traveled home to Nigeria after not being able to go home for two decades and the meal that she had um, at her family's home there. So um, her story has really stuck through, stuck with me through the whole process of making the book, um, but also because uh, just through the political moment that we've been living in in the last f- five years and more, um, and how this story is related to immigration and sort of the connection to home, the longing for home, and how we um, create that connection in different ways. I just was very really moved by her story, and I actually. Um, I actually made the illustration sort of a combination of a few very uh, non-specific photos that she sent me from that trip. And then all the, all of the rest of the details of the illustration were based on her like completely gorgeous writing. So that was a really um, wonderful art experience. Um, Here's another one. This is another favorite, um, this is, goes with Letitia Landa's essay. Uh, Letitia is the co, um, co-director, I hope I'm not getting that title wrong, of La Cocina in San Francisco. And this is her story um, about albondigas, which is uh, meatballs and her family's immigration story from Mexico. 
um, and how she sort of got into the work that she's doing now with La Cocina. So, I mean, I could keep showing you, I could, there's, it's 240 pages. (laughs) (laughs) I think that I think I I I hope that the the question asker is satisfied by that. But yes, and if you want to see more, you can of course purchase the book from Literati Bookstore. I think we have time for for one more question um, before my cat knocks the computer over, uh, hungry <laughs> hungry for food. Um, and uh, it's a question from a viewer who writes, uh, "What would Lindsay?" asks what would Lindsay cook for Abra and what would Abra cook for Lindsay I'm like actually dreaming of the day that we get to do that together after this pandemic um do you want to go first um I mean sure I think that what would I make for you well it's funny because Lindsay and I didn't actually know each other before um she reached out to me about the book and um I feel like we uh well I feel like I very quickly latched onto her as a fellow Michigander um and then have been like move back to Michigan (laughs) and she's been living in Leland which is one of my favorite parts of the state and so I think I would make you like a full-on Michigander meal of um probably make pasties for the nurse and something with smoked whitefish, um, like a whitefish salad to start. And then, um, I mean, I guess like cherry pie for dessert. That's a lot of, that's a lot of crust. <laughs> I mean, uh, but you know, like, nonetheless. Sounds like heaven. <laughs> it's all um, yeah. yeah. So that would be like, a, burner we, would be, we would be making that meal in the summertime then? Yeah, exactly. I think, yeah. And then we go swimming and be like little baby whales. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what would I make for you? Honestly, I've been having so much fun cooking from your cookbook and I cannot wait for your second book. Um, I think, I think I would probably make you one of your, a a twist on one of your roasted vegetable recipes. I've been, we've been making some of the recipes for roasted cauliflower Mm. in our house in the last couple of weeks. And I've never been a fan of cauliflower, but now I am. So I think I would probably want to, um, I don't know, give you, like, I would, I would want to have that experience with you of cooking from your cookbook because of all the things that we just discussed, which is like, you didn't write a cookbook for all those other reasons. You wrote a cookbook so that people like, like me, like I can, you know, approach all these vegetables with a different perspective. So um, I think it would be really fun to cook your own recipes for you. (laughs) <laughs> that would be so fun and is like uh before the book came out um I took a lot of stock out of what Zingerman's sort of taught us with visioning and different things like that and I just sat down and was like you know what are the benchmarks for success how do we measure this and um one of them was that somebody would email me and say I made this thing that's based off of one of your recipes, but it doesn't have any of the same flavor combinations, but it was like, I took this thing and combined it and then brought it to the same place and you gave me permission to do that. So I feel like that's what you're actually offering to cook me, which would be a real game. Yeah, totally. And John, what would you make for us? <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> Mindry and Ann Arbor, so maybe, sandwiches. Well, I was just going to say that. Fun. Maybe you would just get us some, some great, baked goods from Zingerman's. Yeah, yeah, I think I wouldn't try to, uh, I would just, yeah, I would just default to, to something nearby. Maybe I would cook a side, maybe just like a simple broccoli rob or <laughs> Brussels sprouts, or something like that. Um, I think speaks to the fact that anytime someone cooks for you, it's just really a gift and um, yeah. So thanks for giving people more ways to do that. And John, thanks for, furthering the goals of people buying and reading and participating in books. Well, thank you both for joining us tonight on At Home with Literati um, and, and for talking. And we hope we can have you in the store um, soon um, when we're all vaccinated. And um, thank you for making us all super hungry uh, tonight. <laughs> it's dinner time. <laughs> and, um, and to all of our viewers, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, you can, of course, purchase books at literatibookstore.com or uh, right below in the description if you're watching us on YouTube. Um, but we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And we'll see you at the next event. Until then, take care. Good thank night, you all. so much. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you.